This is a mechanism of disease map for glomerulonephritis. We'll be talking about these categories for the disease glomerulonephritis. We're actually going to start with pathophysiology, then we'll get into the manifestation or how you'll see glomerulonephritis. That's the signs and symptoms and the labs, the tests that you might get when you have this disease. And then at the end, we'll talk about the etiology. There's quite a few of them and some distinguishing feature for all the different types of glomerulonephritis. As is the case for most of these mechanism of disease maps, this is a key at the top here, and each of the boxes will be color-coded according to these core concepts at the top. So let's just jump into the pathophysiology. The pathophysiology for glomerulonephritis is that you have inflammation in the kidney, which causes cytokine release and results in glomerular capillary damage. This then results in the glomerular basement membrane being porous. And if it's porous, that means you'll have leakage of protein and leakage of red blood cells. The manifestations of these things are proteinuria. I've put this range in here because if you have more proteinuria than 3.5 grams per 24 hours, then that's actually a nephrotic syndrome. It's possible to have both nephrotic syndrome and nephritic syndrome, but um, we're gonna focus on glomerulonephritis here. Leakage of red blood cells results in hematuria, which is just blood in the urine. Um, if it's microscopic, you might not even notice. Sometimes it can be red and it could be very gross and dark, um, like Coca-Cola urine. In addition, the leakage of red blood cells leads to these red blood cells sticking together in the renal tubules. Oh, there's a bit of a typo here, so that should be R-E-N-A-L. Um, this is seen as red blood cell casts when you're observing the urine under the microscope. So that's also related to the porous glomerular basement membrane. This inflammation in the glomerular basement membrane also results in inflammatory infiltrates, which reduce the fluid movement across the membrane. So this is going to result in a decreased GFR. It's a little counterintuitive to think that it can be porous and still have a decreased GFR, but they both coexist. So you can have leakage of proteins and leakage of red blood cells, but you still have a decreased glomerular filtration rate. This results in oligouria, which is just decreased urination, low, um, small amounts of urine. And if you have insufficient filtering and excretion of urea, then you'll have azotemia. You'll have all those nitrogenous compounds building up in the blood. So you might have a high BUN on your lab values. A decreased GFR also means that you're retaining most of your salts. And of course, if you're retaining a lot of sodium, then you'll have intravascular fluid expansion. The result of this is that you can have hypertension, high blood pressure, and you can have edema, um, sometimes notable in the legs. You'll have a pitting edema or swelling in the legs. So that's kind of the pathophysiology and the manifestations of glomerular nephritis. And it all kind of starts with this inflammation. Now let's talk about the many things that can cause this inflammation in the kidneys. And I have a list of the things here with some of the um, distinguishing features highlighted as well. One cause here is the post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. This is more common in children, usually 3 to 12 years old. It usually happens weeks after a group A strep infection. It could be an infection of the skin or infection of the throat. So if a kid has a sore throat, they often get a strep test for this very reason. The diagnosis is with a positive anti-strep antibody. There'll also be low serum C3, that's a complement protein, and it'll be consumed, so it'll be low on their blood tests. Um, there'll be depositions of IgG on microscopy. So if you do EM, you'll see these humps. And if you do immunofluorescence microscopy, you'll see depositions of IgG, IgM, and C3 on immunofluorescence. The prognosis here is usually pretty good. It's typically self-limiting. The color of this box changes because it starts as a mi microbial pathogenesis, but then really it becomes an, inflama an, inflam an inflammation and cell damage um, component that causes this pathophysiology. Next one is diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis. This is associated with lupus most commonly and also IgA nephropathy. This one can also have a nephrotic picture with it as well. So you might have that proteinuria that's above 3.5 grams per 24 hours. You'll also have low serum C3 levels and on immunofluorescence you'll have a granular appearance. There are three etiologies that are associated with small vesicle vasculitides. The first one is granulomatosis with polyangitis. This one is a Cianca antibody mediated process. The next one is microscopic polyangitis. That's a Pianca mediated process. 
Um, and then there's the eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis. This is also a pianka, but you'll have eosinophilia on your lab tests. So that's a way to distinguish the microscopic polyangitis MPA from the eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis. The eGPA is the eosinophilia. Another one is good pasture syndrome. In this one, you'll have an antibody against the glomerular basement membrane, um, which is a type of type 4 collagen, and you'll be able to see those antibodies themselves on immunofluorescence. This is also a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. These next two are both hereditary. There's thin basement membrane nephropathy, also called benign familial hematuria. On EM for this one, you'll see diffuse thinning of the glomerular basement membrane. And there's Alport syndrome, which is a hereditary disorder. It's X-link dominant, and it's a collagen mutation. So it can result in sensory neural hearing loss and problems in the eye. That's anterior lenticonus and retinopathy. Both of these are hereditary physiologies. Next is IgA nephropathy, also called Berger disease. This is the most common idiopathic subtype, so if we don't really know what's causing it, it might be this Berger disease. Patients will have a high IgA, normal C3 levels, and the renal pathology findings will be similar to those of IgA vasculitis. So on light microscopy, they'll have mesangial proliferation. On immunofluorescence and electron microscopy, they'll have mesangial IgA immune complex deposits. Last one on this list is membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. This one also typically happens in children like the post-strep glomerulonephritis, and this one um, has a nephrotic syndrome as well, similar to the diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis. This one also has low serum C3, and the characteristic finding is the tram track appearance on light microscopy. Now there is another subtype of glomerulonephritis. It's called rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. And these first six at the top can all cause this rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. And it's a slightly different phenotype. You'll, uh, the characteristic finding is these crescent formations on light microscopy, electron microscopy, and immunofluorescence. And this typically signifies a very poor prognosis. Patients might have end-stage renal disease within weeks. But um, these, these top six don't necessarily cause this crescent formation, rapidly progressive disease, but they can. Um, and it's less likely with these lower four diseases. But all of them can just cause run-of-the-mill glomerulonephritis that isn't as bad as the crescent formation, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. This has been a review of glomerulonephritis with a mechanism of disease map. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.